The September 23rd, 2021 meeting of the Woodbridge Township Board of Education will please come to order. Roll call, Mr. Wolferman. Ms. Gordon. Mr. Delapietro? Here. Mr. Harris? Here. Mr. Molnar? Here. Mr. Sedana? Here. Mr. Tamborello? Here. Mr. Trebowasser? Here. Mr. Velez? Here. And Ms. Anderson? Here. Mr. Wolferman, as required by the Sunshine Law, please read the notice of meetings. Thank you, Madam President. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advanced notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof posted as follows. On January 11th, 2021 and September 1st, 2021, emailed to the Home News Tribune, the Star Ledger, and the Municipal Clerk's Office, posted on Ross Street School Number 11 and the Board of Education Administration Building, also published on the school district website. Mr. Velez, please read the closed session statement. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to motion for the approval of the following closed session statement. In compliance with the Sunshine Law, the board must go into closed session in order to discuss subjects exempted from the public portion of our meeting. Discussions to be held in closed session will be regarding personnel matters. In addition, the board will receive legal advice regarding the food vendor contract and student matters. Any information regarding the closed session discussion will be released to the public when the reason for discussing these matters in closed session no longer exists. I have a motion by Mr. Velez. Second. Seconded by Mr. Treatwasser. <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried. Please rise for the salute to the flag and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I have a motion to reconvene? So motion. I have a motion by Mr. Treewazer. Second. Seconded by Mr. Della Petro. All in favor? Aye. 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 Roll call, Mr. Wolferman. Ms. Bourdain? Here. Mr. Della Petro? Here. Mr. Harris? Here. Mr. Molnar? Here. Mr. Sedana? Here. Mr. Tamborello? Here. Mr. Trebowasser? Here. Mr. Velez? Here. Ms. Anderson? Here. Good evening, everyone. Our meeting is going to be a little bit different tonight, so let me start this portion of the meeting with some facts so it is clear why we are here. School lunch is critical to student health and well being and ensures the students have nutrition they need throughout the day to learn. Research shows that school lunches reduce food insecurity, obesity rates, and poor health, according to the Food Research Action Center. Lack of nutritional food in our school is a public health crisis. It is unacceptable, and whoever violates this will be held accountable. For children who suffer from food insecurity, this meal may be their biggest and most important meal of the day. When I heard the stories and I saw the photographs of the food that was served to the children in our district, I was upset, disappointed, and shocked to see such deplorable and disgusting food options for our students. We are champions advocates and protectors of our children. We need a partner that holds the same values, that takes this responsibility seriously as we do. Recognizing this work is critical to the health and well-being to one of the most vulnerable populations, our children. The population that needs to be protected and nurtured. It's unfortunate that you missed the mark, your service was below standards. We need consistency in supplying nutritious meals. There is no room for error. It is our responsibility to ensure that every student in our district receives a proper meal in school. Our parents, guardians, and community have a powerful role in supporting our children's health and learning. I will welcome the public's comment after the board has had the opportunity to complete their comments and questions. Here with, the, here with us this evening, we have Ms. Kathy Kassaboon, the Regional Director from Trotwells. Once Ms. Kassaboon has had the opportunity to make a brief statement, members of the board and the public will be invited to present their questions and comments. 
At this time, Ms. Casavon. Good evening, Dr. Masmino, Madam President, distinguished board members. My name is Kathy Casavon. I'm here representing the food service management company, Chartwells. That's a partner with Woodbridge. First and foremost, thank you for inviting me to speak this evening and share some of the experiences and changes we've made to the lunch po program based on the feedback we've received. We want you to know we take all questions and concerns that students and parents have very seriously. Our door is always open. Our team is passionate about the meals we serve and there's no higher priority for our team than the health and safety and well-being of our students. Throughout the district, we have more than 100 associates working in our kitchens and our cafeterias. Over the past year, we've served more than 1.6 million meals to make sure students were fed throughout the pandemic. During hybrid learning, we served in multiple service points throughout the community. While we refer to our associates as lunch heroes, our students also call them mom, uncle, and neighbor because they live and work here in the community. This evening, I want to specifically speak to some of the challenges that have arose during the first week of school and assure you that this was an anomaly. We are deeply sorry for those where we've missed the mark and know that there were meals that did not meet our standards, let alone your expectations. While we serve more than 10,000 meals a day to Woodbridge students, an issue with one meal is one too many. As soon as we recognized there were opportunities for improvement, we implemented changes. Some of those were on a small scale within hours, and some were made uh, in collaboration with the district within 48 hours. Not only did we sit down and have further discussions with the district administration, we've also met with some of the principals at the elementary schools to talk about how we can best serve meals to their students taking into account both instructional activities and COVID protocols. We are doing our best to customize programs for every school, especially understanding the different needs at every grade level. When we began our preparations for this school year in collaboration with the district, it was decided that cold food would be the best way to serve our students for in-classroom meals. After hearing how much the students missed having hot options, we were able to adjust operations the first week of school and serve hot food and welcome students back to the cafeteria lines beginning on day five. We've also moved from pre-prepared sandwiches, updated our menus to include fresh made sandwiches and hot options. Our regional executive chef has been working with our associates to retrain on our rigorous food quality and safety protocols as well as culinary techniques. As we continue to optimize how many meals are served this year, students and staff and parents can have peace of mind knowing that our plans are rooted in the most stringent health and safety practices that align with federal and state regulations, along with the local health department policies. In all the districts that Chartwell serves, the Food Safety for Schools Guide is the foundation of our food safety system this covers food safety, cleanliness, sanitation, and HACCP, which is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points Training. Additionally, the guide includes a detailed explanation of all the forms and logs needed to document and process and outline our plan for compliance for the USDA and HACCP requirements. Our on-site managers, chefs, and staff are always up to date on their Serve Safe certification, which is certified by the National Restaurant Association's premier food safety course. In addition, we want you to know that all of our associates have participated in the COVID-19 specific training developed with the Cleveland Clinic and supported by the CDC. We appreciate the feedback shared and it's important for us to hear directly from you. We encourage students and parents to raise any issues with our team if they occur so that we can immediately investigate and resolve. I recognize that many of you may have additional questions that we would like to discuss, and I will work with the district to implement the best way to communicate with parents. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Dr. Massimino? Madam President, 
Ms. Casabona, I want to first thank you uh, for coming here tonight. Uh, we have been in constant communication since the first day of school, you and I and, and my administration and, and members of your team. So I do thank you for making yourself available. My question for you is, is uh, direct. I would like to know what steps Chartwell is taking to ensure that there is a quality control program implemented on a daily basis. And I say that with, with this underlying. I worry about today, I worry about tomorrow and the day after. I don't want to do good today and struggle tomorrow. I need it to be good every day. I'm a, I'm a standards-based person. So I need to know, will additional staff be employed or deployed that you already have? When, we're all, when will our district receive its, uh, a district manager that we can work with directly? And will there be any additional plans submitted? I appreciate your question, Dr. Massimino. Thank you as well for the partnership and working together. Uh, I will address the first situation. We have a QA program in place. Uh, it's also established by the USDA, production records and temperature logs. The staff is certified in food safety and sanitation. And we, with Chef Guy, who you met last week, uh, are working through additional training. And that training will be ongoing. We have a considerable number of employees, over 100. Uh, the majority of them did come back after the pandemic, but we do have new employees that we are training as well as actively recruiting with the current on-site director. The district manager, I have several candidates and I've spoken with Mr. Wolferman about setting up time for an introduction with, with the district. Thank you. Madam President. Mr. Molnar. Thank you, Ms. Kazaban, for being here today. Um, in your opening statement, you said within 48 hours you started making small changes. Um, what were some of those changes? The, the first change that we made, thank you, Mr. Molnar, was to move to fresh made sandwiches on site, ordered the appropriate items. That was it, that was? In 48 hours, yes, sir. Um, your pre-made sandwiches, where were they made at? I appreciate your question. I believe they came from um, one of our food vending partners. I'd have to check to see who sent them exactly, but somebody internally within our organization. Was it made on our school district property? like? No. Sometimes we would use one of the high schools as a main kitchen hub and then maybe make everything on site and then satellite it out to the other schools. I appreciate that question as well, Mr. Molnar. We do do that because a lot of the schools don't have the equipment that the main schools have. We do satellite items. Is Chartwell's experiencing supply uh, chain issues, uh, products not being available or? Another great question, Mr. Molnar. Um, obviously, we are one of the world's largest food, safe food providers, and we have a very extensive supply chain, but everyone is experiencing supply chain issues. We have multiple vendors that we work with, and we have modified the menus to meet those demands so that there are, are not shortages. So keep it on that train of thought. I know some of the complaints were uh, spoiled milk or past day milk handed out to the children. Was this because you know, you're having an issue with getting milk and even though the milk might have been a day or two expired, the thinking of Chartwell's might have been it's still technically good to drink and that's why it was handed out or? That is not our standard. We are not experiencing any supply chain issues with milk. We serve 23,000 to 24,000 milks a week. Okay, so with your extensive supply chain, have you been duplicating menu days, like two days in a row, serving the same item, or have you been switching it every day? The menus are in rotation. So a Monday through Friday cycle would be different items, and then the following week in rotation. We typically do a four-week cycle menu. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate your time. Um, I just have a few short questions. Um, speaking of the menu, uh, oftentimes it's reported that the menu listed uh, is not the same menu that's being served in the school. Why is that? Um, Ms. Bourdain, thank you for that question. Um, actually, that was one of the changes that I discussed with Dr. Massimino. Uh, within 48 hours, we made the adjustments to the menu. So what is on the menu is what we're serving in all the schools. Um, I will beg to differ on one of those points is uh, I do see the menu. Um, a salad, for instance, uh, was presented as pasta instead of what was supposed to be on the menu, which was supposed to be sal uh, salad. Um, there's been a few things where uh, personally I've seen and asked the differences what uh, children have seen. Um, no, that's not list that, that's what's on the menu. That's not what was served. Um, so I, I would like to know that that's going to be corrected. As you send your child to school thinking they're going to eat one thing um, and it's not there and they're not happy with what's actually there. We, we, uh, we understand the seriousness of making sure the menu is accurate and the team is working on that every day to make sure the updates are real time. Okay. Um, uh, I think that was, uh, uh, Mr. Molnar, I think, asked the other uh, questions that I had. We're not going to get any more frozen sandwiches, right? <coughs> that would be there correct. There were plenty yes, of those. Thank you. Madam President, if I might. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. I know how difficult it is to be in the position you're in. Um, but you said that all the staff is trained in HACCP, the Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points, I believe you called it. And you also said that they're trained in how to follow the standardized recipes and to execute the food properly. So I happen to have here, because the cheeseburger that we all have seen on the news is the most disturbing. And according to your, your recipe card, which was updated uh, July 31st, 20, or July 30th, 2021, it says that the burger is supposed to be cooked to 158 degrees. Now, according to the government website, it's supposed to be cooked at a minimum of 160. The odd part is, is that according to the food handling temperature log, your manager felt it appropriate to cook it 22 degrees higher than what you have it at. And the interesting thing about that is being held in a warming cart, which doesn't cook things, it just keeps it at a constant temperature. And it stands to reason that if the door is opening and closing, that temperature over time will drop that it will not elevate. Would you agree with that? I appreciate the question, Mr. Trabwasser. I hope I pronounced that correctly. E equipment um, temperatures vary. Typically, typically warming boxes don't cook food. They just hold them That's at a constant. That's correct. They do not cook food. And they typically as the door That's opens right. and closes, that holding box drops in temperature and then reheats. So I looked at the Woodbridge temperature logs and they just don't make sense. So I'm just concerned that what you're doing as you said, you were having your uh, corporate chef work with them to improve this. I, it just appears to me they're filling these out with numbers just to fill them out, not necessarily filling them out with the correct intent in mind. And I also am concerned if your standardized recipe is to cook it below what is the acceptable temperature, then we run the risk of them following this recipe and then doing the exact same thing that they've done before. And I didn't hear anywhere in your explanation of what's been changed that these are all your standard operating procedures and recipes are going to be reevaluated to make sure that they are indeed accurate. This may just be a typographical error, but if you've trained everybody appropriately, as you suggested, uh, they're going to follow this recipe. So, you know, I'm just kind of concerned that I'm kind of concerned that what you're saying is going to get fixed won't because it's a root cause problem. It's not necessarily a training problem. Well, Probably I was cooked inappropriately because they were trained correctly. The specific burgers, we, we prepared 1,867 burgers on the day on the menu, um, and those are throughout different schools. And the process is they cook to the proper temperature, and then depending if they're being satellited, how that product is held. Not sure the reference to the document that you're looking at, but I will put it down for our regional chef to review with the team as well as myself personally. To make I'd, sure I'd be happy to give you the ones that I have, but you cook 710 burgers out of Woodbridge High that day. Right. Uh, cheeseburgers and hamburgers. Now your hamburger recipe says it goes to 165 degrees. 
your cheeseburger says 158. There's, um, but my point is, is somebody should be reviewing the menu, the uh, recipe cards, to make sure that they're doing it accurately. Because it doesn't matter how well you train somebody, if you train them to cook it to what the recipe card says, then you run the risk of them serving spoiled food again. And then if, you're, if they're not truly taking the temperatures uh, at, the time of, at the time that they're being served, as they're required to on the standard production sheet, then we're going to have that same problem. And I just didn't hear those things in, in what you were saying. So that's, that's my concern. Thank you. I didn't specifically bring to the attention that the staff is food safe certified and understanding proper temperatures and how to take temperatures withholding product, but that is included in the training and the retraining of the staff, as well as the food safety certification process. All the cook temperatures are required for the testing for the team to know exactly what they're supposed to do. I do have it in my notes to review the recipe cards for accuracy. Thank you. Madam President? Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Trevos. I'm finished, thank you. Mr. Tamburello? Thank you. Ms. Cosmo, thank you for attending this evening. Um, in your role with Chartwells, you manage other districts? I do. You oversee other districts? Your opening statement or your opening comments mentioned you have over 100 employees here. Do you know the exact number offhand? I believe as of this, this afternoon it was 107 because okay. we're actively recruiting. Years ago, you probably had over 125. You, from, are you aware of how many facilities you serve in the district? Or do you know that minutia, how many buildings you service? 25. Us? Yeah. Um, and so your experience with other districts. Let's take an example of an elementary school with 500 people, and let's take a high school with 1,000 people. How many employees would you put in a, in a school that size that you think is adequate for service? Thank you for the question, Mr. Tamborello. Um, there's a lot of material and analysis that goes into staffing models. It would be depending on how many students bring their lunch. There's a lot of factors. What's cooking equipment available? Are we trans transporting food back and forth? Um, we have a, a staffing model that I've shared with Dr. Massimino and Mr. Wolferman, and our team is actively recruiting. As I mentioned, um, coming back from the pandemic, uh, we had almost 90% of our associates come back. I believe you do have a staffing issue. I think you've had a staffing issue for a while. We, we need to have confidence in our vendors. That's the bottom line. Whether it's a custodial contract, a uh, paving contract, a uh, legal contract, we need to have confidence in our vendors. And I, for one, my confidence is eroding in Charwells. That's all I have to say this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President. Mr. Del Pichon. Uh, I just have a question on, on your on quality control. For example, let's take the topic of spoiled milk. I could see maybe one school, an isolated incident, but it seems like we had multiple schools of spoiled milk. When the milk delivery comes in, before you hand it out, you would think that quality control issue is someone <coughs> would check the date. So if I'm a Chartwell's employee, I look at the date, it's expired. So what is the, when, that, when it's discovered that the, it, it, it's expired, what's Chartwell's policy now, okay? You have the milk, it's expired, so now what do we do with it? Mr. Di Pietro, thank you for the question. The, the QA process goes through multiple steps with every product that's received. Uh, the person is receiving the delivery in, they check the product to make sure it's correct. There's many food safety protocols that have to be checked to make sure if it's frozen that it is, if, if it's opened or exposed that it's discarded or not, we don't accept it from the delivery truck. Milk specifically, if we receive it out of date, we would not accept it into the district. Right. If what? during storage it was rotated and at the end of the, we get usually three deliveries a week depending on the school, but um, those items would be discarded. Right, but there was a major breakdown. If that milk came in and it was expired, at some point it should have been caught before it got to the schools, but it didn't. So now it gets to the schools, so obviously probably someone realized that it was expired. Now does 
does a phone call get made to someone in higher management to say, okay, we have expired milk, what do we do with it? I would have to speak specifically to the spoiled milk. Spoiled milk can be even in date if it's not held well, at the proper we, temperature. Right, well, expired so, milk, take, take the expired milk. So expired milk after we would receive it and if it was you know, contaminated at the time, it wouldn't be received, but then it goes to the school and then the associate that's in that school is also expected to check the dates and make sure they're properly rotated. Okay, so we had the expired milk got to our schools. Was a decision made, that the phone, was a phone call made up to higher management, what do we do with it? And they, was a decision made saying, well, send it out anyway, or what is, the, what is the process? What is your quality control process of when something gets to the school and it's not right? The is milk? there a reporting policy? Is there, a, is there a, a reporting requirement where someone at a higher level makes a decision? So, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm curious to see how this spoiled milk, we have all these quality control issues, made it to the end user and it was no good. This should have been caught way before you know, right. we, talk, we talk about quality issues but it doesn't seem like there was no quality issues and if it was caught <laughs> would we have like 24 schools were any reports made from the people that were in the building to upper management saying hey we got expired milk did anybody in upper chartwell's management know that there was expired milk and was a decision made to put the milk out anyway? The decision would never be to made to put the milk out anyway. That isn't the process that we would have. Uh, spoiled milk and out of date milk are two different things. If you, you can have spoiled milk that's in date if it's not held at the proper temperature. Okay. Um, so that's the QA process there. Uh, they would call the director and say we have out of date milk, can somebody bring in date milk and they would exchange out the milk but we would not serve the milk well if those if if it was supposed to work like that why did we why did our kids get expired milk delivered to the school like why wasn't what happened with the quality control measures that we had a major breakdown where these kids got served <clears throat> expired milk there was definitely definitely something happened there you know I could see one school okay not all the schools I'm not aware that all the schools were delivered out of date well there's other other schools actually that I'm not aware that anywhere well, I know that there was a concern about spoiled milk which is not out of date it's milk that's not held at the proper temperature so that if it were delivered to a classroom and if the student didn't drink it at that time then it does get out of the temperature danger zone I, I'm not aware that any school was delivered out of date milk. Well, I was just curious to see because, I mean, you know, it seems like if the decision was, if, like I said, if it affected one school, it would be one thing. But it would seem like when there was multiple schools involved, and, you know, if you have these quality control uh, procedures in effect, and it, 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 had, it had to be reported. So someone had to make a decision. I'm just curious, how did that, if, it, if we have all these quality control measures, how did it get to our kids? Like, and whatever the issue was, it, it, it was an issue. My question is, how are you gonna fix it? So we have milk as an issue, and like um, Board Member Trebweiser said, um, the cheeseburger, you know, with the, with the temperature, with the cooking temperatures. So like, how, how are you, like, you know, what is Chartwell's plans to, to fix that? Our QA process is, is pretty stringent and we're held accountable to multiple jurisdictions. Chef, our regional chef will continue to train as well as myself and the director in the facility and the new district manager as we hire one. And we actually have, will continue to work on making sure food is at the proper temperature. Okay, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm concerned, you know, like, you know, tomorrow, um, you know, the rest of this, you know, the, um, next week, you know, that, that these problems are gonna be corrected. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's a crisis. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, like I said, if it was isolated, one incident, but, you know, it's, I mean, you can see the amount of parents that are here that are, that are concerned, you know, 
um, it's an issue and it's it's got to get fixed. You know, so we does take. Char do you have a, does Charles have a plan to fix this so that our kids get, you know, good edible food, you know, drinkable milk? Can we rest assured like that this is you know like do I have like you know do I have to worry about that if my child goes to school tomorrow that you know he's going to get a uh, you know a decent meal you know uh, milk that's going to be good to drink you know not expired milk would not be expired and if it was it would be rotated into a situation where it's not given to a, a student and the temperature control which is another part of the QA process is also documented I believe uh, Mr. Trebwasser also has the documents for that because the temperatures are recorded and we will continue to train we would okay well as long as they have a plan you know that that these kids are going to get you know an edible you know uh safe meal to eat that's that you know that's that's pretty much all i think our, our, our main concern you know it's and we we feeding children is what we do so we have okay. multiple protocols in place for that Thank you. Thank you. Madam President. Mr. Harris. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. All right, you, you were all done, Frank? I'm done, yes. All right, thank good. you. All right, thank you. Uh, hi. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, you talked about the, the district manager resigned, to, to my knowledge, or he's being reassigned. What is the time frame on the hiring of, of a new individual to take that role? I have several candidates as soon as the district does the introduction background check process is the only time frame. Okay, all right, more, so it's unlikely to be someone months. from within your organizational structure now. It, it could be weeks to at least. Mr. Harrison, yeah. if I may, uh, can, you, can you clarify what you mean by once the district does the introduction? That well, I'm doing an introduction with the candidates that we have. I have three candidates currently Okay, but, you, in the but you're picking the candidate. That's correct. Okay. So the yes. introduction will be made after you pick the candidate. You're not waiting for us. That's correct. Okay. I want to clarify that. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All right. So you have three candidates. That's, that's, a, that's a good start. Now, the individual, when they are selected, how many school districts will be under this individual? Woodbridge. What, Woodbridge only. That's correct. Okay. All right. That's good. All right. Uh, you know, so this person oversees the school district. What is the rest of the managerial structure under that individual? So there's a director. Okay. And then three assistant directors, okay. a chef, and a purchaser. Okay. And, and then there's a lead for every school. There, there's a what for every school? A lead person who is responsible for that school. And then okay. there's the elementary schools are divided up with a lead reporting to them. Okay. And then the associates. Okay. that work right. in those schools. Okay, so we have oversight. All right, that's great. Along the same line of questioning that uh, Mr. Del Picho had, in terms of the training, in, in terms of identifying for quality control purposes, is every employee that works for Chartwells trained and, and trained on the same things, if you will? Yes, the associate, at the associate level, sure. there is a certification for that position, uh -huh. and then the salaried managers have a, a much higher level of certification, which is from the National Restaurant Association. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, next question, and I know members of the public want to ask questions. Is there an avenue besides uh, the school principal to for a, a, a family member or a student to lodge a complaint, uh, like an online portal or anything of that nature, for you to receive quality control? Do you do surveys or anything of that nature to get feedback from students and parents? We do have a survey system. Um, obviously, with only being a week and a half into school, we haven't rolled that out, but we do have a survey system. Okay. In addition, that they can meet with any member of the team at any time. Okay. The, the survey system, how is that conducted? Is that online? Is that? It's online. Okay. And, and that's provided to students and parents that's on a correct. regular basis? Mm -hmm. And we have paper copies as well if, if okay. somebody doesn't have access to okay. Okay. the internet. Thank you. And, and then finally, could you speak to some of your recruiting efforts to, to fill some of the uh, openings that you do have? Are you soliciting Woodbridge Township residents? 
to, to join us and, and, and how are you doing that? We are. We post on multiple websites, hiring websites. Um, actually, our network goes over 2,000 different avenues and posting in the local paper. We also do a referral bonus for any associate that has somebody, and that is a perpetual bonus based okay. on the time that the associate stays with us. Okay. Now, now final question, and, and thank you to the board and, and to yourself for the latitude. Uh, given the very tight job, excuse me, labor market, are, are you what, what? What is your starting salary for an entry level associate? Twelve dollars. Or starting uh, hourly wage. Um, uh, uh, $12.63. How much? $12.63. $12.63. We're governed by a CBA. Excuse me? We are governed by a CBA. Okay. All right. Understood. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President, for the time. And thank you, ma'am. Madam President. Mr. Belay. Uh, thank you for coming here tonight and addressing our questions. Uh, most of my questions involve staffing level and uh, training, and uh, I think we went over that already. It appears that you might be a little short-staffed. Short uh, one of the other complaints I got was um, certain food items are more popular than other food items, naturally. And as such as Ms. Bourdain pointed out, uh, the menu might show uh, one item, and you may have that item, um, but then you're running out of that, that item a lot. Um, the students, you know, they look forward to that lunch period, and uh, some of them may only want to eat that one particular item. Um, how can you assure us that this won't be a continued problem, running out of popular food items? Uh, thank you, Mr. Velez. The process in the beginning of an opening school year is working through what are the most popular items. We're a week and a half in, and that will continue in the menu cycle as we get feedback. We make real-time adjustments. Uh, so, for example, we all know that pizza is a very popular item. If on the production records we show that we served 900 slices of pizza That's exactly on a what Thursday, I, was to. I didn't say pizza, but pretty much that pizza was pizza is very popular. Yes. Um, then the next time that pizza is on the rotation and menu, we would make a thousand. And then if that time we served a thousand, after that next week we would make one thousand two hundred. We would continue through that process with the production records real time. All right. Thank you. And that's ongoing because students have different preferences on different days. That's all I have. Thank you. Madam President, if I may ask another question. <clears throat> um, me again. I just have two questions. One, um, Dan brought up the, uh, and you, you answered with that there are surveys available. Can, can you let us know where those surveys are located? Thank you for the question, Ms. Borden. We normally start those after the first 30 days of school, so they will be out coming out in the next week. And or so. who, who do the surveys go to? Um, they go to parents, students, family members. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen one. Um, and what do you do with the responses to the surveys? Um, those would be calculated, and there's metrics that, and algorithms that go with that, and then we would share those with our... And you can address those school by school? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and my next thing was, you talk a lot about quality control, and I'm just kind of curious how, with all of those stop measures that you have, that the food was served the way that it was to bring us here today. Thank you again for the question. Um, the decision to go with cold food because of the protocols and making the quantity of sandwiches is how we got to our partner in making the sandwiches for us. That was obviously stopped uh, the second day, and we were making sandwiches on site. All the other questions about food safety and sanitation uh, will continue to be with training and working with the team. Um, 10,000 meals a day is, is a large number of meals. That's the job, though. Indeed. Um, and I think the other questions I had were already answered. Thank you. Madam President, if I could just have one follow-up question. 
Kind of to piggyback on what Mr. Delapetro was talking about and the quality control and the processes, and we'll, we'll go back to the milk because it, 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 it gets me wondering about how many supply chains do you deal with for like milk? Do you deal with one dairy? We have one primary dairy and we have a backup dairy Okay, company. so when your milk order comes in, where does it go to? Does it go to the schools or does it go to, do you have a main hub somewhere? Like where it the goes, it's delivered to the schools. Okay, because my thing is with the milk, if it came in and let's say, all right, it wasn't outdated on the container, it was spoiled. Did you have the ability or do you have the ability to trace that, where that came from? We was did. it that the refrigerator at the school might be broken and it's not holding the proper temperature? Did we get it spoiled? So you would be able to, so do you know where that shipment of milk came from? Th that's correct. Every delivery um, is tagged with a specific allocation that tells you the manufacturer and then where that manufacturer received that product from. And yes, we could trace it back. So then um, do you have information that you could present to us, I'm not saying right now, to show us how, where that shipment of milk came from, where you stopped it, where you took it out of all those school buildings to make sure that any of those containers of spoiled milk were out of that school the day that it happened, that it was reported? We, we can show you how many milks were delivered to what school on what day, yes. I can I'm, show you that. I, I know you could do that, I need to know how did you stop the problem once it was presented to you that, listen, there's milk that might be within date, but it's spoiled. <coughs> what did Chartwells do to say, okay, pull all that milk. We know where that milk came from. So many containers came here, so many containers came here. Check the supply that's left over. That milk was from that order. Do you have that ability to do that? We do. Okay. And then we would order new milk in, which is what we did in this particular right. scenario. So you could guarantee us all here today that all that milk that came in on that order, that that spoiled milk was in, was taken out of our schools that day. I can, but I also want to clarify, um, thank you for bringing up the equipment and the temperature logs and how product is handled. So um, in a scenario where the student gets the meal, um, the temperature at that point has obviously left refrigeration. And ideally what happens is that the student drinks the meal, milk during the meal. Um, if they were to not, then that's out of the temperature zone for an extended period of time. But from the standpoint of tracking the product, it would be discarded and we would replace it with fresh product. You're right, it's not coming out of the, it's not going to the student exactly cold, but you know, and I'm gonna show my age, when I was in school, we used to put our lunch money in the little envelope and every week we'd have our, lunch, our milk delivery would be in a crate outside our classroom. Mm -hmm. And if whenever our teacher got to go get the milk container and bring it in and then passed out the milk, that milk could have been out there for an hour, hour and a half, you know, none of us got sick. None of us had spoiled milk. So yeah, you're not gonna get frosty cold right out of the refrigerator, but I don't think a milk could spoil in a matter of an hour being, you know, getting ready to get the lunch line, you know, ready to pass out. I'm just more worried about the, you know, having confidence in the ability of chart wells if there is an issue with spoiled food and going back to trace to make sure that, you know, that food never ever all that, all that contaminated food is out of the system, discard it, and don't have to worry about any of our children having any of that food. We have a, a, the process for that. Thank you. Now I'm gonna open up the floor to the public. When you come to the microphone, please state your name and the section of the township you reside. This session is outside of our normal public comments, so I'm gonna ask on this particular issue that you keep your comments limited to two minutes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christy Salzano Hansen. I have two sons in the district. I live in Woodbridge Township. Um, I'm a former substitute teacher in this district. I'm a PTO mom. 
and I am absolutely beyond upset, disappointed, and disturbed at what's been going on. And I'm here speaking on behalf of the moms that have voiced their concerns to me. Um, and as a mom myself, my son came home the first day of school and rummaged through my pantry because he was starving because his turkey sandwich was frozen. And I've seen the pictures, the moms have communicated with me. It's not acceptable, none of it. And Chartwells has a terrible reputation. This is not something new. We know this. And we as parents want them gone from our district. We do not want you to do business with them anymore. We need a new provider. I'm hearing excuses. There's breakdowns everywhere. For children to get served raw food, the one thing that we shouldn't have to worry about as parents is sending our kids to school and having to worry if they're going to come home ill from the food that they're being fed. And for some of our district students, it's the only good meal that they have in a day. They need to be able to rely on your dependability to serve them a nutritious meal because it may be all they have. I'm lucky enough to be able to make my kids sandwiches every day, but not everyone else is. It's deplorable, it's unacceptable. There should have been checks and balances. How could anyone look at that hamburger and think it was acceptable to feed children? One, one day the meal was goldfish and a muffin in elementary school. What child should be fed goldfish and a muffin? I'm passionate, I care about the children in the school district. I have personally taught them as well as having my own children here. And I am just beyond upset, disturbed, and concerned. And we're not gonna be happy until we have a new food provider. Thank you. I'd like to echo those sentiments. Um, the fact is, you're a for-profit company. And I've been a parent in the district for 10 years with two children. I've never seen a survey. And I'm sure you, they can all attest. I'm a very involved parent. So the, the fact that you're saying that they're sent out, I question the, I guess, validity of that statement. Um, I think this speaks to just a bigger issue in general with school lunches and the result of outsourcing to corporate interests. I mean, it comes down to the fact that you're for-profit and you have a history, like she mentioned, of criticism in your parent company as well, and have actually been involved in multiple multi-million dollar settlements, one almost $20 million, for providing insufficient calories, poor quality of food, and misappropriation of funds. Your company also has, just generally has a history of prioritizing profits over student well-being by sourcing out to the lowest bidding vendors and suppliers, which results in poor quality food. I know the impacts of COVID have probably you know, reduced your profit margin, which is upsetting to a corporation, but that shouldn't cause, come at the cost of our children. You should not be cutting corners to increase your profit margin. I understand why most districts in New Jersey have made the shift to the corporate outsourcing, but this practice was actually banned in the United States until the 70s, and thanks to Reagan, our regulations have been further lowered where things like tomato sauce and french fries count as vegetables now. Um, like I, and I just want to echo what Ms. Ander, Ms. Anderson also said, that you know, you're serving some very vulnerable students. There's a large number of students in our district that rely on the free and reduced lunch program. As she said, my son can come home. He has a pantry full of food and a refrigerator full of food. He's not going to die. You know, it's not going to starve. But there are a lot of kids that don't have that. And it's beyond deplorable that you would put money over our kids' well-being. And I hope the district takes an innovative step and looks at other districts that have looked at options of bringing it back to the school district itself, doing farm to table, things like that. I realize there's cost and management involved in that, but it's our children. And they're right. Hi, my name is Vincent Feliciano. I'm from the Forge section. I've been a homeowner owner for 21 plus years. Madam, what is your title at Chartwells again? Excuse Regional me, Director. Regional Director. So Excuse me, sir. You sir? I want you to have your full two minutes so she won't respond until you say everything you want to say. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, so you're up in the hierarchy up there. So Mr. Molinar asked you about the sandwiches preparation. He asked you, who was your food vendor? We, a person in your position, I find it hard to, for you not to know who your food vendors are. How do you check their certifications also? It sounds like a politician answer that you're giving us here. Um, and also, how can we trust Chartwell to do good by our children and the children of the Woodbridge Township School District if you don't even know who your food partners are and how do you even certify them? Uh, you mentioned you make, you make small changes. I believe you're wrong in that statement. You should make immediate and big changes. Like the other parents before me said, there are kids that eat anything because they're hungry. 
What happens when one of these kids winds up in the hospital and God forbid something happens? Is Chartwell's gonna be responsible? I don't think so. And you mentioned this is an anomaly. It is not an anomaly. My son is in the high school. Last year when you guys were giving on lunches, he brought home two quarts of milk, which was three days expired. Had I not checked the date, he would have drunk them. Um, he also came home with a bag of beans in a plastic Ziploc bag from the lunch provided by the school and a sandwich where one of the council members mentioned about cheese. He came with a, a white bread sandwich with about an inch block of cheese in it and the bread was moldy. So you guys definitely have to do better. I mean, you're quick to raise prices for lunches, et cetera, and all that stuff. How about you take care of us first and we will support you. I agree with the other parents. We definitely need another provider. Ms. Casabon, there were questions that were asked. You may answer them. Thank you. Um, Good evening. My name is Anna Angelica excuse Feliciano. Me, excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. I need you to answer those. He asked you three questions. Are you, are you, do you remember the three questions he asked you? you? Wanna, uh, I'm going to ask the question again. Okay. The one was the certification of the vendors. Yeah. All, all of our vendors are certified. What is the process you do to certify them? How do you, if you don't even know who your food vendors are, how do you certify them? She's going to answer your question. Okay. Just. Our corporation certifies our vendors with multiple checkpoints along the way. And who are your vendors? A, a person in your position should know who you're dealing with. Our main vendors, I could give you the list of all who our vendors are. Just give me one off the top of your head. Cisco. Cisco. So you know that if something happens to our children, not only is Chartwell's responsible for liability, so is Cisco and the Board of Education for allowing this to happen. Mm -hmm. So shame on you for not being prepared for this meeting, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Anna Angelica Feliciano and I wanted to address this problem with the food system and the lunching because you started off your statement by stating that this was an anomaly and it's not because my daughter graduated from Woodbridge High School last year. We have been with the Woodbridge school system for five years now. We have never ever seen a survey sent to the parents regarding the food. We never had an opportunity to discuss it. Last year when my children were doing hybrid, they were going to school two days a week and they were giving lunch in a bag before they got on the bus. The food was molded. My son received a Pillsbury bagel that had mold on it and supposedly had a strawberry cream cheese that was not strawberry, okay? He also had spoiled milk sent to him. My daughter would not even pick up the lunch bag because she knew that everything in there was spoiled or no good. Supposedly there was a ham and cheese sandwich that was sent out. Again, there was no meat in it. There was only one slice of cheese and it was so thick and disgusting that my children would not even eat it. I said, don't get the food, just leave it there. And for some reason or another, for the children that don't take the food, the extra bags that are left over are given to the children that do come with food. My son came home with two shopping bags, the size of ShopRite, full of food that the school was trying to get rid of. Outdated milk. You clearly see that it had no, um, the expiration date was clear there that it was expired. And then the ones that were not expired, when you opened it, it had an odor to it. And I don't understand why we continue to dance around these questions because there's a lot of specific questions that were asked to you and you very generally answered it to say, well, there is a roster, there is a process, there is quality control, but yet you didn't answer the question specifically that the board has asked from you. I don't understand a person in your position how they're not aware of what's going on. You don't have specific answers. The, the, these sandwiches that are giving out, the food that's being spoiled, the hamburgers that are not at the temperature they're supposed to be. We send our children to school to get an education. We don't send them to school so they can get sick. And at the end of the day, this is criminal because you know what, if we as parents would have done that to our children at home, I rest assure you that someone will be knocking on our door, Dyfus will be there taking our children away from us, 
for not providing them with adequate food and lunch and clothing and food. And I don't understand how this is just okay for you to sit here and think that, oh, well, where there's processes in charge, there's people that are there, and no one is addressing the issue. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm so disgusted and disappointed, and I should not have to be sending my child every day to school for lunch, and, and no one is addressing the problem that these kids, and luckily my children are old enough to now look, and I always tell them, examine your food, but when their kids are in elementary school, they, all they do is just eat. They don't know what's being fed to them. They, they know they're hungry. It's the only food that they have available to them. And that we shouldn't be relying on children to be examining their food when, when the adults are the ones. Before that milk goes out the door from your facility, someone should be checking it. And whoever didn't check it should be fired. Because I, I would appreciate it if you would sit down and eat the food that's being served to our children. But you. you wouldn't eat it. And you know you wouldn't eat it. My name is Comera Cummings. I live in Fords. I'm new to the district. And someone on this side said to the lady from Chartwells that, you know, apologies for you being in this position. I do not apologize. You're the one in charge. You wear the white hat. You have to take it. You have to make sure that people are being properly trained. My child was offered a mozzarella cheese stick and pretzels for lunch. And that was it. No sandwich, no burger, nothing more than that. Never mind the fact that things are not being stored at the proper temperatures. Like he said that back when we were little, we got our stuff at the door in the milk crate. It sat there for a little while, but nothing was spoiled. You know how long it takes for milk to curdle, for cheese to start to happen? That is disgusting. I, for one, definitely want Chartwells to no longer be our food provider, because that is beyond disgusting. There is no excuse. If we need to go back to lunch ladies, lunch ladies or something like that, I don't know what needs to be done. I don't know how you vet these companies because I've gone on the internet. Google is free. I can see news articles from years ago. And like the other lady said, the lawsuits. You are opening the district up to a multi-million dollar lawsuit when kids get sick and end up in the hospital. Parasites can go in their organs and their brains and stuff. That is disgusting. You have to do better. You are in charge. It all falls on you. You want to wear the white hat? There it goes. David Pinkwitz, Island. I just want to say, when the opening comments were made by Chartwells, I was a little disappointed because if it weren't for the board president's comments before that, I would have assumed there was some minor issue that didn't really need to be addressed. I never felt like there was anything being taken seriously. I mean, all I heard was some comments, so we adjusted in 48 hours, then we found out the only adjustment, not to say it was a small adjustment, but changing the sandwiches and where they're made, and then other, other changes are made later. So I just, I feel like Chartwells, as others have pointed out, hasn't taken enough responsibility for the many reports that we've heard. Whether that be spoiled milk, whether that be rotten food, frozen food, whatever. One thing I do want to, I have a couple questions. One question that could be answered either by the district or, or by Chartwells is, when does the current contract with Chartwells end? Uh, the current contract we're in. Uh, the second question, is a follow-up of Mr. Delapetro and others after him about the quality control. So quality control has different components. There is the formal component. We talk, you talked about you know, measuring temperatures, recording the temperatures, making sure everything's right. But then there's kind of like the unofficial quality control, which is you have a number of employees that are part of the food process, including the people closest to the students, which are the associates. And the question I have is, do your associates feel empowered to point out a problem in the food? So when I hear a story about, you keep mentioning, well, at this beginning, well, we, have, we agreed to have cold food. But you didn't agree to have frozen food. And when I hear stories about sandwiches that are frozen, obviously someone gave those sandwiches out. Most likely in, at the end of the process, most likely an associate. Do your associates feel empowered without 
the risk of getting fired or disciplined in any way to say there's a problem. All these sandwiches are frozen. These look rotten. These aren't able to be eaten. That's all I have. Uh, your first question, our contract ends June 30th, 2022. Okay. That's the current term. The QA component, I believe that's also into question two and three. Our associates are empowered to make decisions real time for anything that they feel is not at a standard that they would want to serve or eat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ronald Jerez. Uh, I have a, a child going to Mobb Street School. Um, the first thing I did uh, when the school started was check the menu um, on the on the school website to figure out if I should be sending my kid with uh, you know with food from home or if they can be eating the school the school's lunch. And the first thing that was very apparent to me was that none of that food that was listed on there is considered lunch. I saw things like chips and dip or yogurt and pretzel. That's a snack. That's not adequate lunch for a child during you know, six or seven hours that they're there in the school. Uh, so my question is, is for the, the district. Is there someone who is checking these menus? You know, they're posted there for at least two week period before they, they're brought to the school. Is someone checking these menus to make sure that what is being provided is adequate food? And if it isn't, we can raise a flag and say, hey, this is not food for kids. We need to improve this. Because if the lunches are listed for two weeks, it shouldn't have come to where we are now, where the parents were the one who caught this and raised the flag. This should have been caught by the district before the food was even brought to the school. Mr. Wolferman? Yes. Um as far as uh, having our menus and looking at it, we do have a uh, food service director. We're also looking at some options as to uh, having somebody else that we could employ within the district to, do, to partake in a role that would include uh, what you're talking about. Okay, I appreciate the answer. Um, but it seems to me like if we do have somebody who's, who's that's their job, they clearly weren't doing their job in this case. And I think it's something that we should definitely look into. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Pollock. I live in Siwar, New Jersey, and I'm a sophomore here at Woodbridge High School. I have had a firsthand and secondhand experience with the lunch here at Woodbridge High School, and I have no other words besides absolutely disgusted. I have been at Avenel Middle School, Matthew Jago, and of course, there has never this, been this problem before. From the first day of school, when I received a frozen solid turkey and cheese sandwich. I stopped having the lunch from then on out because I am so blessed to have a mother who is also here today who can make me a sandwich every day. But from then on out, I have peers and friends who I sit right next to who are still receiving this lunch daily. For example, today's lunch was about five carrot sticks with a side of a small container of tuna from what I saw. And I just simply cannot believe from that being a minimal amount of food, I know that would not fill me up for the rest of the school day. And with already the shortage of our lunch time around about 20 minutes, I just simply don't understand how this can be acceptable or really enough for high school students, never mind our elementary and middle school students, because to be honest, I am not my main concern. Even my high school peers are not my main concern. The fifth graders, fourth graders, even kindergartners who are at school and don't understand that they do not have to eat that. And if they do, they might become sick, which is also unacceptable. So I really think there needs to be some kind of change, whatever that is. I'm not involved, obviously. But my main concern is the younger kids underneath me who need to be helped and need to understand that they should be safe enough to eat what is given to them. Thank you. Hi, 
good evening. Anjali Walters. I have a Woodbridge graduate and two are currently in Woodbridge High School. My children are not eating. Kids at their tables are not eating. So besides the fact that it's a waste of our tax dollars, you're also wasting food. It's going right in the garbage. I assure you, these kids are boycotting. So you can win the trust of everyone in here, and you might even convince some of them, but how are you gonna win the trust of these children who don't want your food? They don't trust you. It's disgusting. And even if they tried it, they have other kids that are like, ew, you're gonna get sick because you're eating that garbage. They don't trust you. That's all I wanna ask. I wanna know how you're gonna get their trust back. Do you have a marketing campaign geared towards children? Because we can say, hey, the lady swears, quality control, she's not gonna eat it. Besides that, I'd also like to say there should be other options. Um, we have health concerns in our family. A lot of these high carbohydrates, milk options, we can't partake in. So when our children are boycotting the food and they can't drink the milk, or whatever, are there other fresh fruit options, beverages, waters available to these kids? Because, you know, we want to get them home safely and make sure they're not, you know, hungry and dehydrated. So what are you going to do for the kids? That's it. I'd just like to know. Do you? Ms. Casabon, you can answer the first question. So, so you have two questions. One, um, we, we do have what you would call marketing for students, but really it's about serving great food and having them enjoy it. That's how we gain their trust. How do you get them to try it again after everything that's happened with the news? How do you say, hey, it's safe, I swear? Like, it's well, we gonna... would partner with the district to make sure that we're able to communicate that. That's gonna need to definitely happen. I'm, I'm letting you know, unless you wanna keep throwing food away, because right now it's going right in the trash. Thank you. You did have a second question. You had a second question fresh, about yes, fresh special beverages. meals um, or specific Other diet, options, diet maybe. restrictions. Yes, um, we can accommodate all types of uh, diets. So if you have, you can speak with the director, and mm -hmm. they can make sure that those meals are available. Okay. William Neville from Seaworn. Um, I get, I'm not going to beat up on Chartwell anymore because I think everybody's been pretty vociferous along with the board. But I also look at the board of education. You know, who picks these providers? What's your standards? You know, uh, this is not the first time that you've had problems with these people with Chartwell. You know, is there a formal complaint system within the BOE? These are questions that need to be directed to our Chartwell's representative. Oh, I can't question the board? There'll be a time for you to question the board. Oh, the later board. on? Thank you. Good evening, Tom Maris, Ford, New Jersey. First of all, I'd like to thank all the people that are here tonight. Uh, I think we all share in your outrage. This should never have happened, and it, it is disgusting. Um, some of you may know me, I've been around a long time. I was one of the initial people that were vehemently opposed to Chartwell ever coming into the school system. Now you see why I was, and exactly why I had said this type of thing was going to happen. They were for a profit agency, you kick the moms under the bus. Chartwell can sit there and say, we take care of the moms, the kids call the moms. They will never be the moms today that they were back then when they were working for this district because they took part of it. They were part of the school itself, not employees for a profit company. How many times, I'm sorry, when does your original contract start with Woodbridge Township? And since then, how many times has it been renewed? How many times have you faced this type of situation within our school district where you've had this type of vehement, <coughs> pardon me, vehement complaints? Also, in your interaction with the school system, who supervises your people from the school district? In other words, who's the on-site representative for the school itself that is there with your person at each school making sure that this doesn't happen or should not happen mm -hmm. because they're checking your staff, that food quality. Who are those people? My last question, and may fall to the school, is I heard a lot of questions asked from the board, and it, great sounding questions. But a lot of it sounded like pure PYA, 
You should know the answers to those questions that you were asking. You shouldn't have to have Chartwell tell you. Ms. Uh The contract has been renewed um, two times, and we had one emergency extension because of the pandemic. Um, we have multiple people that we partner with in the district. We do not have anyone from the district who specifically is at every school. No, 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 that, those were the only two questions he had. Okay, so I want to thank you uh, for being here tonight, and this will end this session with us. Thank you. Thank you. Will someone make a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meetings? So motion. I have Second. a motion by Mr. Trevoiser. Second. Seconded by Mr. Sedana. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried. Mr. Wolfman, please state for the record any notice of bids received by the board. Madam President, on August 26, 2021, we opened PSA number 8170 LES 25, additions and alterations at Lafayette Estate School number 25. Dr. Massimino, please introduce our student representative from Colonia High School, Shakti Venkatesan. And I also would like to acknowledge the fact that Mr. Pace, the principal from Colonia High School, is here tonight with us to support his student. Shakti has not only achieved academic success as the number one student of her class. She has also been very active in after school activities. Through the years, Shakti has participated in the Ecology Club as well as the Multicultural Club, but found her place of interest in science research. Shakti has participated in science research since her ninth grade year, and last year won the science fair in microbiology. She joined Asian Culture Club, which was new to Colonial High School last year, and continues to be an active member. In addition, she is a founder of the Math Olympiad. Shakti has been inducted into three honor societies, Mu Alpha Theta, National Honor Society as the co-president, as well as the Science National Honor Society. She is also a member of the CJCEE, the Central Jersey Consortium of Excellence and Equity, that created the Anti-Racist Pledge and the Anti-Racist Infographic. Outside of school, Shakti has a diploma, if I say this wrong, please correct me, Barbara Thetum. My apologies which is a South Indian classical dance form after learning for 11 years and also teaches the Tamil language every Sunday at her Tamil Academy. With a passion in the sciences, Shakti plans to study pre-med to become a surgeon with the number one choice of continuing her studies after high school at the University of Pennsylvania. With the leadership and passion that Shakti has shown over her four years of high school, she is destined to be successful in all of her endeavors. We welcome her tonight. Dr. Massimino and the Board of Education for inviting me here this evening. At school four and five lessons taught on September 10th to commemorate the 20th anniversary of 9-11 Open houses were held on September 20th and September 22nd, celebrating the week of inclusion with a pep rally on September 24th, which is tomorrow. At School 22, new student orientation was held on August 31st. Open house was held on September 9th. A moment of silence was held on September 10th in honor of those who lost their lives on 9-11. Teachers taught lessons to commemorate the 20th anniversary of 9-11 a walkathon to raise money and awareness for pediatric cancer 
Awareness Month was held on September 14th. During the week of inclusion, students unpacked and signed our anti-racism pledge. The PTO held spirit nights at Detalia on September 20th and September 21st, where a portion of money from meals purchased was donated back to the school. At Avenel Middle School, a remembrance of the 20th anniversary of 9-11 was held on September 10th. Upcoming celebrations include the Week of Respect and Inclusion, Fire Prevention, and School Violence Awareness Week. Recognition was received for four students receiving NJHS Outstanding Achievement Awards, which includes a $500 scholarship. The technology classes are covering concepts in STEM, coding, and robotics. The fall baseball and softball teams are preparing for the upcoming season. Students are active in a variety of clubs. The Student Council is coordinating school-wide spirit activities. The Sidekicks program will continue so that our students may work alongside elementary students to provide mentoring programs. At Colonia High School on October 9th, the girls soccer team will participate along with 11 other GMC teams to raise awareness for pediatric cancers and the Marissa Tafara Foundation at Metuchen High School. Six juniors met the qualification to be nominated for the NJ Seeds College Scholars Program. This free program prepares students for highly competitive colleges with excellent preparation and sufficient financial aid. All clubs and activities are well underway. Additionally, new clubs have been created, such as the Math Olympiad, Fashion Club, and the Investment Club. Hispanic Heritage Month will be celebrated with the assistance of Student-Led Action Committee and the Spanish Honor Society. Video presentations will be released to the student body along with an evening celebration in October. This year's band performance is called The Phoenix. The district SEL program has been a success. The focus has been on identifying emotions and providing tools on how to express them in a positive way. Currently, there are over 200 students par participating in athletics. There has been at least 10 college visits thus far. During the upcoming Week of Respect and Week of Inclusion, we will unpack the district-approved anti-racist pledge created by both CHS and FMS students. Lastly, CHS will have open house on Wednesday, September 29th at 6 p.m. Thank you for this opportunity for being part of this evening at the board meeting. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Thank you for that report and welcome to our meeting. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. The public is invited to speak at the conclusion of each agenda. Comments at this time should be limited to the items on the agenda being presented. When you come to the microphone, please provide your name in the section of the township in which you reside. As per Regulation 1100D, comments must be limited to no more than five minutes. No response will be given until you have completed your opportunity to speak. Superintendent's agenda. Dr. Massimino, do you have any recommendations? Madam President, I have 19 items to present to the board. Do I have a motion for no the motion. superintendent's agenda? Mr. I have a motion by Mr. Treewazer. Second. Seconded by Mr. Sedana. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Are there any comments or questions from the public? Roll call, Mr. Wolferman. Ms. Bourdain? Yes. Mr. Delapietro? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Molnar? Yes. Mr. Sedana? Yes. Mr. Tamborello? Yes. Mr. Trewasser? Yes. Mr. Velez? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Policy and Planning, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Madam President. The Policy and Planning Committee on recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools presents the following 11 items. I move the adoption of the foregoing. I have a motion by Mr. Harris. Second. Seconded by Ms. Bourdain. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Oh. Madam President? Mr. Harris. I, I did want to just give a shout out here. It's an early one. Uh, this year, we had, well, excuse me, last year is more appropriate. We had 216 employees who were recognized for perfect attendance. Typically, the number's around 30, if memory serves. So mm -hmm. I want to give a, a recognition to those employees who I know under very diff difficult circumstances, uh, 
completed perfect attendance. So I want to I want to recognize you all, and they are uh, noted here in the uh, in the packet that you should have received at the door. And uh, for those viewing from home, you could you could read it online. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Are there any comments or questions from the public? <clears throat> Good evening, Tom Maris, Forge, New Jersey, and um, hopefully I'm on the right page tonight. I'm in policies, and I'm looking at face coverings, and going down to face coverings, point A. Um, it says staff, students, and visitors are required to wear face coverings unless doing so would inhibit the person's health. Um, I want to put a point on that. When you say health, that is both physical and mental health, and if so, how is the mental health aspect of that covered? By whom and to what degree? So Do you want me to keep going with the questions or you want to answer that one? Yeah, say, say all your questions so you have okay. opportunities. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure. Um, if you go to, on the next page, point C, individuals shall be frequently reminded not to touch the face covering and to wash their hands frequently. As we know with children, uh, that is a, a very almost, if not impossible, task to, to accomplish. Uh, the Mayo Clinic, if you're familiar with it, and if you're not, I suggest you please look at it, has some very good guidelines about what has to be done as far as mask wearing, if they're going to be effective at all. And if that's not followed, essentially, you're wasting your time on masks. Um, and I'll just leave it, I'm sorry. One other question, who's paying for the masks, by the way? And also, who's paying for the test if someone in staff or the teacher decides they do not want to be vaccinated? It says that they must be tested once or even twice a week. Who pays for those tests? And that's my question. Okay. You Dr. Massimino? So I think, it, it, Madam President, I think it's important, Mr. Maris, to, to look at the whole policy. Um, when it talks about health, it depends on what the exemption is based on. It, it, there could be a, a variety of diagnoses. You'll see in the, uh, later on in the policy, it talks about consultation with our district's medical physician. So if there's something that hasn't been established in an IEP or something else, we're going to defer to a a medical physician mm -hmm. to give us guidance on that. Uh, regarding the masks, if a student does not come in with a mask, they will be pro provided with one. And with regarding to the vaccination testing, we opted in, as all districts had the opportunity to opt in or opt out of the state testing program. So the Department of Health has already reached out to us. We opted in. They will set up and provide the testing for all of those individuals that opted not to get vaccinated. That would be at no Mr. cost Wolfman? to the employee or the teacher? Excuse me, sir, you have your opportunity to speak? I was just answering. He made a statement to me. I was responding to it. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Massimino. Mr. Wolfman, can you answer the question about who's paying for the mask and the yes. test? Madam President, um, as far as the masks go, we have a number of donated masks. Um, we also have some that we did purchase through grants from the uh, state and the federal government. And as Dr. Massimino mentioned, we opted in so that uh, the state would cover the cost of the, the testing. Again, I can't ask her any more questions, but I don't find those answers particularly satisfying. Thank you. Hi, David Pinkwitz, Island. I just have a couple comments and, and a few questions uh, on the agenda. Uh, first, a comment about the face coverings. I'm glad to see that the board is reinforcing the governor's order and, and passing this agenda item despite some of the opposition in our most recent meeting before this one. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a good thing um, for the school and for the students and all the people that work in the buildings. I did have some clarification I'm seeking on the vaccination testing item. So there's reference to volunteers as part of the list of covered individuals. Um, would this include, uh, well, well, just to clarify, it talks about regular visits. I guess that's the definition of who's covered, partly. So would parent volunteers be included 
in this. And for example, you have PTO officers, booster club, band parent volunteers that regularly visit the schools. Are they covered under this policy? And if so, how would they both be checked for vaccinations or testing, et cetera? Um, and I know a few years ago, the school started, the district started instituting an ID card for people like, it said like hall pass for visitors in the building. That obviously didn't happen last year. Is that happening again this year for parent volunteers? And is that related to this at all? And if not, that's you know what I ask you to comment on. Um, another on the agenda, you're revising the testing schedule. On the testing schedule, there's a start strong assessments, which I'm not really familiar with. I think they're new. Um, so if someone could just comment what those are for. And I'm particularly have a question about, like I have a student in grade 12. It mentions that testing will occur in October, but there's also like, for example, school day SATs and, and there's PSATs for other grades. So when will that test occur in October or how will that be administered? And just to comment on what the exams are in general. Um, and then just a brief comment, it's kind of ironic after the beginning of this meeting that you have a resolution on here for National School Lunch Week, October 11th through 15th, where you are, when you pass this, you're resolving that all who provide food services to the school district be acknowledged for their excellent work. Just as a comment, you don't need to respond to this one, but hopefully by the time we get to that week, we will be talking about excellent work again and not some of the problems that we heard about earlier today. Thanks. Mr. Pigowitz, your question about the volunteer? Yeah, whether parent volunteers are covered under this policy, it talks about in like the opening paragraph. Okay. Volunteers, so we're just trying to see how that affects parents or not. Okay, Dr. Mesmino. Yeah, so we're, we're being very careful with how we're handling volunteers. Obviously, we don't have the state working with us yet. The, the vaccination, uh, the, the testing hasn't begun yet. We're gonna take this very carefully. It's a, it's a very precarious spot to be working with volunteers and talking about vaccination testing when they're not district employees. So we're gonna limit the interaction we have with volunteers. Uh, I sent out guidance to our principals, for example, about Halloween with parents coming in. They are not allowed to be in the classrooms with the students because we don't know their status or their exposure. So if they wanna help set up, they can do so before or after. But we're really concerned right now with the, the vaccination records and the testing of our contracted employees and those people that are in our buildings on a daily basis. So we're gonna, we're gonna proceed very carefully with that um, because obviously it's a big district and, and we're not gonna expose our children to anything beyond you know, what they're already exposed to out, out in the world. Yeah. The next question was about testing, the testing schedule. Yeah, and specifically the start strong assessments. What are they and how will they be delivered in October or when? Sure, sure. It, it, if you, I mean, I can give you a general answer or if you'd like Mr. Pinkowitz, I can send you some if that would be better, a little bit more comprehensive, if that would be okay? That would be That's fine. Better. Is that okay? Okay, sure. For the stru yeah, I mean, it's a pretty comp it's pretty big. I don't want to give a long-winded answer, so if you want, I can, I can send you a little bit more specific information to answer your question. All right. Is that okay? All right, that was it. Okay, very good. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Roll call, Mr. Wolferman. Ms. Bourdain. Yes. Mr. Delapetro. Yes. Mr. Harris. Yes. Mr. Molnar. I'll be abstaining on item number six. I know the theme of the um, resolution is wild about lunch, but I don't think it's in the context that the resolution reads. Um, yes, on all other items. Mr. Sedana. Yes. Mr. Tamborello. Yes. Mr. Trebwasser. Yes. Mr. Velez. Yes. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Curriculum agenda, Mr. Trebwasser. Thank you, Madam President. The Curriculum Committee on recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools and the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction presents the following 13 items. I move for the adoption of the foregoing. I have a motion by Mr. Trewazer. Second. Seconded by Mr. Molnar. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Are there any comments or questions from the public? Roll call, Mr. Wolferman. Ms. Bourdain. Yes. Mr. Delapetro? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Molnar? Yes. Mr. Sedana? Yes. Mr. Tamborello? Yes. Mr. Trebwasser? Yes. Mr. Velez? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Finance and insurance, Mr. Tamborello. Thank you, Madam President. Finance and insurance committee on recommendation of the superintendent of schools and the business administrator board secretary. 
presents the following 13 items this evening. I move for the adoption of the foregoing 13 <coughs> items. I have a motion by Mr. Tamborello. Second. Second. Seconded by Mr. Trebarzer. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Oh, Madam President. Mr. Sorry. Harris. <laughs> Well, I'll sleep here. Uh, item number 13, I just want to highlight for the public's benefit that the district and the township grant writer, uh, Megan Kushba, are taking a proactive approach to addressing the condition of the sidewalks at schools one, nine, and Colonial Middle School. Uh, you know, our sidewalks sometimes are hazardous during the, uh, during the winter months, sometimes forces students out into the street. Uh, you know, we, we ought to provide uh, safe walking paths for pedestrians as well as, you know, mothers with strollers, students on bikes, and so on and so forth. So I want to commend the administration for taking a proactive approach. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any comments or questions from the public? Tom Maris, Ford's New Jersey, on finance and insurance, um, point number two. Uh, which deals with the requisition for taxes for the, from the general fund in the amount of uh, $15,913,274.50 and the debt service in the amount of $417,851.50. I'm primarily concerned with the, the latter amount, the $417,000. Um, that is for bonds, is it not? And if so, what is the total bond debt of the school? that it, the school uh, district is carrying, if that is simply the service on it for one month period of time. The second question I have is number 13. Uh, I'm sorry, number 11. And I see there's a bid place for $223,000. And I'd like to know if that was done on a competitive basis. And then finally, on the last page uh, for the um, Approved award for PSA project. Uh, I won't go into all the nomenclature at Lafayette State School in the amount of $13,389,000. Exactly what is being done for $13,389,000? Can you please detail that? Thank you. Mr. Wolferman. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the <laughs> amount that is shown on item number two for the debt service tax is a monthly amount. Yes. It is based on our um, budget. The amount of debt that we have, the bond debt that you requested, I do not have off uh, the top of my head, but I'm happy to provide that to you. Um, for number 11, uh, E-rate has its own way of procurement where it's done through E-rate, so it has been competitive bid through that process. And we do, in fact, get a, a portion of that uh, reimbursed to us. Um, and the last question for the uh, Lafayette State School, we are getting uh, a very large addition and upgrades throughout the school. Um, I can give you more details if you'd like, I can send you that information. But it is uh, several classrooms um, and in increased capacity at that school. Okay, air conditioning, anything along those lines? I'd have to look at all the details. I don't believe air conditioning. Only one question is, do you need a formal OPA request, okay. or you just simply send it to me? You know what I'm looking for. I need to submit an OPA and go Maris. through that, or Mr. just Mr. simply Maris. send it to me. Which Mr. Do you Maris, prefer? we have a rule here so that yeah. we're fair to everyone. When you're done speaking and you've asked your questions, we're going to respond to you, yes. and then that's it. There's no follow-up and back and forth. You're not a board member. We're just looking for clarification. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Not easy to get. Roll call, Mr. Wolferman. Ms. Bourdain. Yes. Mr. Del Pietro. Yes. Mr. Harris. Yes. Mr. Molnar. Yes. Mr. Sedano. Yes. Mr. Tamborello. Yes. Mr. Trebosser. Yes. Mr. Velez. Yes. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Security and School Safety, Mr. Velez. Thank you, Madam President. The Security and School Safety Committee on the recommendation of superintendents for schools presents the following one item, and I move for the adoption of foregoing. I have a motion by Mr. Velez. Second. Seconded by Mr. Sedano. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Are there any comments or questions from the public? Roll call, Mr. Wolferman. Ms. Bourdain. Yes. Mr. Della Pietro. Yes. Mr. Harris. Yes. Mr. Molnar. Yes. Mr. Sedana. Yes. Mr. Tamborello. Yes. Mr. Trebosser. Yes. Mr. Velez. Yes. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Buildings and grounds, Mr. Harris. 
Thank you, Madam President. The Buildings and Grants Committee on recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools and Assistant, excuse me, and Business Administrator Board Secretary present the following two items. I move for the adoption of the foregoing. I have a motion by Second. Mr. Harris. Seconded by Mr. Trewasser. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Ms. Anderson? Mr. Harris. Yeah, I, uh, uh, the question just, just came up on the previous agenda about item number one, about the $13 million uh, award award contract for school 25 this is the large edition uh, similar to the school 28 edition that's being made uh, this was made possible by by the voters of Woodbridge Township uh, two marches ago March of 2020 under the the large uh, 80 89 million dollar bond referendum so that's where this is coming from it will be inclusive of a new gymnasium and I believe it's about 10 to 13 classrooms I'm conflating with uh, school uh, 28 as well. Uh, it's large enough, it's almost doubling the size of the school. So that's what uh, that is, uh, that $13 million, uh, $13.3 million is accomplished. So I just wanted to clarify that. And I think there was even a follow-up question whether the school will be air-conditioned. That portion of the school, of the new, of the large edition, will be air-conditioned like our previous editions. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. <coughs> Are there any comments or questions from the public? Roll call, Mr. Wolferman? Ms. Bourdain? Yes. Mr. Delapintro? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Molnar? Yes. Mr. Sedana? Yes. Mr. Tamborello? Yes. Mr. Trebosser? Yes. Mr. Velez? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Transportation, Mr. Delapintro? Thank you, Madam President. The Transportation Committee on recommendation of the <clears throat> Superintendent of Schools and the uh, Business Administrator Board Secretaries present the following four items. I move for the adoption of the foregoing. I have a motion by Mr. Delapetro. Second. Seconded by Ms. Bourdain. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Are there any comments or questions from the public? Roll call, Mr. Wolferman. Ms. Bourdain? Yes. Mr. Delapetro? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Molnar? Yes. Mr. Sedana? Yes. Mr. Tamborello? Yes. Mr. Trebosser? Yes. Mr. Velez? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Personnel agenda, Mr. Molnar. Thank you, Madam President. The Personnel Committee on the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools and the Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources presents the following. Tonight, I'll be moving 47 items. I have a motion by Mr. Molnar. Second. Second. Seconded by Ms. Bourdain. Are there any comments or questions from the board? <clears throat> Are there any comments or questions from the public? Roll call, Mr. Wolferman? Ms. Bourdain? Yes. Mr. Delapetro? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Molnar? On item number 20, I'll be abstaining on the name Charlie Molnar. Yes on all other items. Mr. Sedana? Yes. Mr. Tamborello? Abstaining on number 47 for now. Yes on all others. Mr. Trebosser? Uh, on item number 4, I will be abstaining on the name Paul Pastorino. On item 34, I will be abstaining on the name Linda Trebosser. And yes on all other items. Mr. Velez? Yes. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Harris. Madam President, I, I made a mistake there. Uh, yes. Mr. Wolferman, uh, would you please uh, note me as abstaining on item number four for Mr. Paul Posterino? We voting yes on the remaining agenda. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I apologize for the mistake. Sure. <clears throat> Mr. Bush, do you have any recommendations? No. I don't this time, Madam President. Thank you. Is there any old business that should be brought to the attention of the board? Is there any new business that should be brought to the attention of the board? Madam President? Mr. Harris. I just have one item this evening. At the, the conclusion of the, the broadcast here, uh, <coughs> the TV35 crew has a bulletin at the end of the meeting. It lists a number of phone numbers, contact information, other uh, very general information, and then subsequent to that, Mr. Uh, Martins was kind enough to put on the PDF of the college acceptance list. It also is inclusive of the military branches our students have been accept have en enlisted in, as well as the trade schools that our students have enlisted in uh, or enrolled in for this fall. So that's the class of 2021. You can check out all the all the phenomenal schools, trade schools, colleges, and once again the military service branches that our students have enrolled in. Uh, we're always proud of our students, no matter where what they choose to do after graduating from our district. Uh, and I think it's a great representation of the variety of, of different places our students 
are accepted into, and I think it, it shows the value of a Woodbridge Township School education. So please check out that list. It's on our website. It's on our social media. And tonight at the conclusion of the broadcast, you'll see it up there as well. Thank you, Mr. Martins, and thank you, Madam President. Sure. We will now open the meeting for public comment. When you come to the microphone, please provide your name in the section of the township in which you reside. As per Regulation 1100D, comments must be limited to no more than five minutes. No response will be given until you have completed your opportunity to speak. Tom Maris, Forge, New Jersey. I'd like to take a moment to recognize all of the, uh, the parents and residents that were here at the last meeting, including the board, of course, um, when it was a lot of concern expressed about the pros and cons of masking. Um, I think it showed that everybody in this township is deeply committed to making sure that we get the children back in the schools and that we do so safely as possible. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of dissension about still the, the benefits of masking or not masking. And I don't know if the board had come to a decision as to whether they would approach the state as other school districts have done and asked for the governor to reconsider his position on that, particularly when it comes to the um, masking of children who may, I think that it has been addressed. Let me back that up. Um, I would say more so the ability to have students stay out of school and be taught at home and or how they will treat the staff if uh, the staff itself decides that uh, they have immunity because of natural immunity having had the virus before so their antibodies are high. They shouldn't be excluded or forced to take a vaccination against their will. And I would hope the school would at least look at that and then come up with a decision and let the community know whether you will join with the others saying, Mr. Governor, please modify your mandate and allow people to have parental choice and make sure we do not lose any good school teachers. Because I'm very concerned about the teachers as well. As long as that's, uh, I'm on that topic, if a teacher tests positive uh, for the COVID, they are quarantined for 10 days, I believe. During that time, if they do not show any symptoms, are they being paid? Uh, as, or do they have to use their sick time to compensate for the fact that they're being out for the 10 day period? That also would apply to staff. If children are quarantined for a 10-day period, how are they being educated? Is there then remote learning? And that was one of the things I was going to mention a little bit earlier about going back to having that remote learning capability. Because as we've seen, there are cases progressing within the township, unfortunately. And I suspect that's going to continue to increase before it decreases. So there are, I think, many factors now that we're back into full operation that need to be addressed and looked at, and perhaps the governor needs to be advised or at least asked to soften his position on some of these hard-nosed issues that he's taken. Has the um, district received, finally, information from the state <coughs> regarding what must be included in equity, diversity, and inclusion curriculums? I know they were working on it. I know at the last meeting it was stated that they had not the board had not yet received or the district had not yet received that information from the state. Obviously, you're still pro <coughs> progressing on that. But even there, I bring some questions up. I was fortunate enough to meet some people at the fair on um, Main Street the other day. And they were making complaints about what was being taught to their children as far as gender pronouns. And apparently, if they're not using the proper pronoun, teachers are chastising them, embarrassing them, and even deducting points from their test scores or their papers for not using the mandated protein, pro, I'm sorry, pronouns. And finally, my last question is, has this board or the district <coughs> received any notification from any state, federal, or other agencies regarding having to take on additional students who may be from illegal families that are here that have crossed the border and or refugees coming in from other countries. Thank you. Uh, the last question you asked about the refugees that 
that Sorry? didn't come. You asked the question about the refugees? Right. What was the question? Repeat it. Yes, I'm sorry. Has the board received any notification or the district from any state, federal, or other agency that they will be expected to educate any given number of children who came here illegally and or are here as refugees? We didn't receive any notification. None? No. Okay. Um, educating remotely. We can take that one. So, Dr. Massimino. Madam President, so we had to have some uh, technological upgrades and some device deployment. So our initial plan for quarantine instruction was to provide them with uh, after school interactions. They would receive asynchronous work from their teacher and then they would have after school uh, touch points, uh, Zoom meeting, Google Meet with their teacher. We've been able to successfully deploy all of the devices that were purchased. So starting next month, uh, we're gonna use next week to roll it out with the teachers. Starting next month, we'll have a different platform for quarantine instruction where students will be able to look and listen. And those, de those details will be forthcoming, but unfortunately we had to wait for devices to be deployed and, and some mm -hmm. technological upgrades because we have to make sure the system is strong enough to handle what we want it to handle. But I think it'll be a, a significant improvement. We wanna give the students the best we can offer um, in lieu of virtual instruction, which the governor does not allow at this point. It's quarantine instruction, so we want to make that as close as possible as we can so that they can experience the, the classroom uh, teacher. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank the you. question regarding pay, how are the teachers compensated if they're not working? Does that fall into their own drawdown on sick time or are they on paid leave? <laughs> yes, they use sick time. if I can have another bite at the apple on that question, then if that teacher is teaching and she is not really, he, he or she is not really sick, but they've been exposed and they're into quarantine and they have shown no symptoms, they come back to school and they are then teaching again and the same incident happens where they're in a class where they're suspected of being reinfected. Do they then keep drawing down on that sick time? Doesn't that get to be a little cumbersome and unfair to the teachers or staff? Each scenario is different. My question for you is, is that teacher vaccinated? Because that changes the status of whether or not they have to quarantine or not. Well, then we get into the whole thing about forcing teachers to be vaccinated. And uh, even if they were vaccinated, well, there right, is more than enough question. evidence no, to show that people do still we're trying get to avoid. It. Excuse me, you don't run the meetings. They Excuse do. Excuse me. You're the hired help. Your time help. is done, sir. You're the hired Please help. Please step away. You're done. Thank you. Thank you. You're still the hired help. <laughs> You're not going to be disrespectful. How are you? I'm Bridget Baldwin from Seawarn. I just was uh, here tonight to um, ask you to reconsider having the middle schools have lockers. Uh, my daughter is four foot five. She weighs 70 pounds soaking wet and her backpack is 28% of her body weight. I weighed it this morning, it's about 20 pounds. So, and that's with one book, three binders and three folders. So. I'm just asking, and I know there's a lot of parents who are concerned about lockers and the weight of their backpacks. I have several parents say that they had to replace their backpacks already. I think that's a little ridiculous. Um, I know the Chromebooks are a little heavy, but that was um, without her Chromebook. So three binders, three folders, her, and it wasn't even including her water bottle. And again, she's a smaller child, so it was about 28% of her body weight. So if you could just reconsider lockers. Dr. Masmino. Madam President, Ms. Baldwin, I had a conversation with the middle school principals and they will be giving out lockers over the course of October. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, David Pickwitz, Islin. I'll ask first one question that should be easy to answer after I'm done. Uh, and item number four in the personnel agenda, you're appointing Paul Posterino as the Assistant Superintendent of Curricular and Instruction, I guess to replace Mr. Bader, who is retiring. Uh, the question I have for that, I don't think I've missed it. Uh, he's obviously the principal of John F. Kennedy Memorial High School as, at the moment. Uh, is, the, is the principal job currently being posted or being interviewed for, and can we expect a permanent replacement in place by November 1st when he takes over this position? And then, the other comment, it was on the COVID dashboard. So I've looked at the numbers and most of the numbers are, are fairly good. 
the one school that kind of stands out amongst all of the schools, especially given the size differential is school number one, uh, which has a lot of cases, both faculty as well as students. I guess the question is, has there been any evidence, especially with that particular school, but any school, although the other schools are a little more spread out, of any community spread in this district where students came to school, spread it to other students, or faculty members spread it to other students or faculty? Uh, so th th that's basically it. I don't have any comments. Just want to know, has there been any finding of community spread within the schools? Um, and also one brief comment. <clears throat> I know we were t I was told by our principal, Mr. Pastrino, that you know we're notified whether somebody in the community has tested positive for COVID. What we aren't told, at least in our letters, is that some of those people actually never were in school when they might have been exposed, potentially. Like, they remember the community, but is there, have there, has there been any thought? Like, I know, like, my daughter's college will say, these people have been on campus, these people haven't been on campus, and you get kind of a split. I realize the numbers are a lot smaller in the district, but has there been any thought of saying, you know, if somebody comes back, let's say, from a two-week vacation, and they're sick, but they never step foot in the building, never exposed to anybody, that's a different case than the person that obviously arrived on the campus of their school. Um, has there been any thought of splitting those numbers out in some way? All right, that's it. I'll just wait mm -hmm. your response. Dr. Massimino, can you answer the question about the communal spread and the principal? So with regarding your, your question about Mr. Pastorino, uh, yes, we're looking to have a smooth transition to both have Mr. Pastorino in place upon Mr. Bader's retirement as well as a principal in place at John F. Kennedy when Mr. Pastorino assumes that role. So we're going to move as expeditiously as, as we can. Uh, with regarding the numbers at school one, that, a lot of that came within the first week. I did speak with Principal Baylog. Uh, it, it's, it's hard when the kids come in and they exhibit symptoms, so it, it was the first week of school. I think it was unfortunate. I think we had a couple students come in with it, and then you have close contact, and, and that is unfortunately the reality that we're dealing with. So, um, you know, it, it, it's why it sticks out. I do think that was an outlier in that regard because it was the first week. So, you know, we handled it the way we would handle any other situation. And then your last question was about um, parceling out. It, it's very hard to determine where somebody got it. Uh, generally, if, if we see something in our school, we're going to send it out. We can't, we're not a college, we can't identify certain things. You know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of confidentiality, so we're sharing the extent that we can. Um, there was no COVID dashboard last year, so we're trying to be as transparent as possible. There is one letter that goes out that is very specific that says if it's specific to your child, you will get a phone call explaining what the quarantine procedures are. So what we're trying to do is obviously send it out to everybody so that the school knows, okay, there's been a case. They can then check the COVID dashboard, but there's also in the second paragraph of that letter very specifically says, if we believe your child was in close contact and there is a, a quarantine need, we will, we will have a school administrator or nurse reach out to you. So that's where we're at with the notification. All right, thanks, and thanks for the dashboard. It's of course. Good evening, Reverend Donna Stewart. I represent the Perth Amboy Area Branch of the NAACP, which covers Carteret, Perth Amboy, Sayreville, South Amboy, and Woodbridge. I come tonight to introduce myself to you because there's way too many of you for me to find you individually and introduce myself to you, but I want to introduce myself to you and want you to know that we look forward as the NAACP to working with the Board of Education here in Woodbridge. This is my first meeting. It will not be my last. Um, we are looking forward to making sure that there is true diversity equity, equality, and inclusion in this district. We are very proud that we have two of our members that will be coming to speak, Amber Jarrett and Jimmy Dombrowski, because they fight for the rights of all people and not just people who look like them, live in their neighborhood, and their economic um, status. I also want to say happy National Hispanic Heritage Month because that's where we are and we celebrate all people. I also want to congratulate the student representative. I'm not sure how to say your name, but I will make it a plan to say your name and learn how to say your name correctly. So thank you for being here and doing all that you do. And we look forward to, with your parents' um, permission in the future, working with you to make sure that there is um, equity, diversion, and equality in the schools. 
as well as I heard you being part of um, multicultural events and, and anti hate and anti-racism events and things like that. So we do look forward to working with you. So whatever we can do to make sure that that happens, that's one of the reasons that we are here. So we look forward to working with each and every one of you. And thank you again for this time. Thank you, Reverend Stewart. Amber Jarrett, Woodbridge Popper. Um, I was here tonight to address a couple of things, um, but the lunch was certainly one of the primary ones. Um, while, char while Chartwells may say that feeding children is what they do, I question how well they do that, and I want to just emphasize my plea for the district to assume more of a leadership role in the state and look for more creative and innovati innovative solutions to the lunch problem and make sure that we're not in the news for things like poor lunches and questionable murals and things, because it just looks bad. I mean, our district doesn't perform well on tests, and then we're in the news for things like this. It, it's not good for our community. Strong schools build strong communities, and we can't use, keep using these political platitudes that are overused like best schools around when clearly we're not. We need to do better for our kids. And we need to be in the news for ensuring that our students' well-being is a priority. The second thing I wanted to talk about is the week of inclusion, which is this week. And again, I think that's a great start. And I saw the communication from Kendall Ali about the books that were listed, and I think that's great. I'm, I'm sure parents appreciate being aware of like what is actually being read in the classroom and having access to looking at those books, um, especially as you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion be continues to become more polarized and politicized, and there's a lot of misinformation out there that has led to fear and even parents pushing out for cameras in the <laughs> classrooms and such. I just want to continue to advocate that the district makes more of an effort to collaborate and clearly communicate with families. Um, I think families need to be more involved. You need to have parent workshops, open forums to explore the topics of diversity, equity, inclusion, and ha answer those questions and concerns so that parents are getting real information and not a bunch of crap from social media. Um, I know we've, you know, you've been mentioned the implementation of equity committees at the schools, um, but as noted in previous meetings, they have not been implemented consistently across the district. And I mean, as a parent, I've yet to hear from my any of my children's schools, the middle school or the high school, now that he's there, about these committees. Um, had I not gone to board meetings and interacted with you myself, I wouldn't be aware. So I just want to highlight that again because it's obviously a continuing issue. Um, I also want to just mention that this isn't a program that, you know, I realize you can't just hand this over to the parents and say this is what it is. So that's why you need to involve them in the process and educate them as well. I also hope that the books included are just a small sample of what's going to be in classrooms, and I hope teachers are going to you know, get the resources and the tools they need so that all children can readily see themselves in the classroom. Those books are great, but you know, it's a very small sample. Um, and students need to see themselves in the school and the classroom throughout the year. We can't minimize it to heroes and holidays where we have a week, and it's like, okay, we're included now, you know, um, or reduced to trauma, like just learning about slavery and the Holocaust. You need to make sure that the contributions and the positive things about different cultures are also being brought into the cur curriculum. I know recently some people have been advocating for a return to the three R's, but I think that is an incredible disservice to our kids and our community. And it's actually a very pervasive problem in districts like ours who do perform poorly on standardized tests. That seems to be the reaction. Let's you know, beat down the basics and rote learning. Um, but I, I think our society continues to become more complex. And we need to really strengthen, you know, because of the pandemic issues of equity, et cetera, we really need to strengthen our commitment to adequately prepare students by teaching things like digital citizenship, um, being creators of technology instead of just consume, blind consumers, being able to analyze the impact of things like social media and target marketing on um, society as opposed to having a high school class on, I'm sorry, Microsoft Word, an entire class. My son took that last year, I, and then on Microsoft Excel. The district doesn't even use those platforms. They use Google, and he wasn't even able to do any of the things with that platform because he had an iPad and not a Chromebook that was necessary. So I think we need to relook at things like that, a curriculum that's a little antiquated, and really emphasize critical thinking and problem solving, problem solving skills, and most importantly, the development of empathy and the ability to consider perspectives, especially those that differ from our own. As we can see, in society in general, we're lacking that. Um, and I just think this is another opportunity for you to make that slogan, best schools around, more than just, like I said, an overused statement. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, James Dabrowski, Woodbridge Proper. 
As a parent of a fourth grade child, I was pleased to learn that this week, September 20th through the 24th, is being celebrated as a week of inclusion across every elementary school within the Woodbridge Township School District. As a letter from our district DEI director, Mr. Kendall Ali explains, the goal of this week is to provide an opportunity to build an inclusive school culture where all students feel part of the school community. The activities will vary by grade level, but will include wearing school colors, discussing the anti-racism pledge, and the reading of books that embrace diversity. As a reminder, our elementary anti-racism pledge states that I will stand up for others and not be a bystander. I will make sure my words are kind and show I care. I will be kind to everyone in person and online. I will treat others with kindness and respect. I will honor and celebrate what makes us special and different. I promise to keep learning how to make myself, my school, and my community a more accepting place. When I asked my son if he was aware of this pledge, he said yes, but that the key word anti-racism has never been mentioned at all. So hopefully tomorrow maybe it will on the last day of the week. I was pleased to see that the district has begun to take action, oh, I'm sorry, but more important than an anti-racism pledge is of course anti-racism action. I was pleased to see that the district has begun to take action and that it no longer observes Columbus Day and also in that our schools will be closed the Monday of June 20th in observance of Juneteenth for the first time. The Woodbridge Township government, on the other hand, under the control of John McCormick, hesitates to take such action, as all township administrative offices are still being closed on Monday, October 11th, in observance of Columbus Day. Additionally, a Columbus Day celebration under the guise of Italian American Heritage Day is still being planned for Sunday, October 10th at 10 a.m. at Town Hall. At last year's Italian American Heritage Day, the first speaker clearly revealed the cloaked intention less than three minutes into the ceremony when he stated, as we gather here this morning and in cities across our nation, we observe Columbus Day. Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin, Senator Joe Vitale, and Congressman Frank Pallone were all in attendance, with the latter two actually delivering remarks that attempted to justify celebrating Columbus, a horrific murderer, rapist, enslaver, and colonizer. Near the end, a representative from the Knights of Columbus accepted a pro proclamation from Mayor McCormick on behalf of Woodbridge Township and immediately remarked, I just want to say everybody's aware of all the controversy going on about Columbus. A hundred years ago, this would have never been an issue. That telling statement is extremely troubling and only proves the need for change. A hundred years ago, Woodbridge would have never raised the progressive pride flag or celebrated Juneteenth, two inclusive events we only just began to acknowledge for the very first time in Woodbridge this past June of 2021. And as Woodbridge begins to deepen our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism, we look forward to many more such important and inspiring proud firsts for our community. Speaking of which, a number of residents of conscience would like to see Woodbridge finally join the hundreds of other municipalities across our nation who have replaced Columbus Day with the inclusive Indigenous Peoples Day. In fact, a resolution making this change official has been presented to the mayor and council in hopes that they'll pass it at their next public meeting on October 5th, and we're hoping that we can count on our Board of Education and Central Administration to support this anti-racist action and stand with Indigenous Peoples, whose land we're standing on right now. Lenape Ho King, to be exact, the Lenape name for Lenape land. On the Smithsonian website for the National Museum of the American Indian, there's a page called Unlearning Columbus Day Myths, Celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day. The last sentence of this page reads, we encourage students to advocate for Indigenous Peoples Day as a replacement for Columbus Day in their school, city, state, and beyond. As educators, I hope we all realize that we are still always students first and that we make sure to model the anti-racism pledge we expect our students to follow by demonstrating actual anti-racist action. So to our esteemed board and central administration, can we please count on your support with this long overdue anti-racist action? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll wait for a response to the question. Can we count on your support to advocate for Indigenous Peoples Day in Woodbridge Township? It's the same. Yeah, I mean, it's you, you, you just say the Board of Education can't just answer a question like that. They've got to deliberate, consider, make decisions. So. Can, can, we, can we please, can, okay, can you please consider advocating for replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day in Woodbridge Township? Anyone can answer. Okay, the board, I think the board will take your, your comments into consideration, and, and that's all we can do right now. Okay, you could do it in Metuchen as well, Mayor Bush, because I know Metuchen's named right, after listen, a, uh, Right here, I sit here as the board attorney for the Woodbridge Board of Education. And at this point- I know your job to protect them from transparency and accountability, but an answer would be great. A yes or a no would be really helpful right now. We have to deliberate, as he said. I'll send you the resolution and the 
all the information. It's, it's a really important thing. It's really bare minimum when you think about it. If we're committed to anti-racism, we can do this. Thank you for your time. The chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So motion. Second. I have a motion. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Molnar, seconded by Ms. Berdan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried. Meeting is adjourned.